This video will take you through the calculation of the standard deviation. Now remember that we discussed in class how distributions might have the exact same mean but very different degrees of spread or variability of those scores around that mean value. In the case of the diagram that you see here, both distributions have a mean of 52, but notice that the spread of scores, the, the degree of variability around the mean value of 52 is quite different for both distributions. So we need a way to quantify this variability around the average or mean value. Here are the characteristics that we want our measure of variability to possess. We want it to be unique to a given distribution or set of scores. We also want this measure of variability to reference the mean of the distribution. Or in other words, we want to understand this measure of variability to be a certain distance away from the mean. Third, we want it to describe the average amount of variability in the distribution of scores. In class, we thought that perhaps the range might be a good measure for us, but we're going to see that it doesn't meet our characteristics or criteria that we laid out in the previous slide. First of all, the range is not really specific enough to any single set of observations. So take a look at this example right here. For distribution or score set 1, the range might be from 650 to 250, and that gives us a range of 400. For the second distribution or set of scores, we might have a range of 1,075 to 675. Again, that's, on, that's a range of 400. So range is not going to be particular to any given set of scores. In other words, different sets of scores might have exactly the same range. The range is also rather crude. We want a measure that looks at the average distance between each score in the distribution and the mean, um, but the range is something closer to the total amount of variability in the distribution, so we don't really, it doesn't really get us what we want. It also in no way has anything to do with the mean of the distribution. It takes the highest score and the lowest score and the mean's not really involved at all in the calculation of the range. Finally, it's important to understand that the range does have utility as a descriptive statistic, but it won't do what we want it to do in this case. If we want a measure that is somehow referenced to the mean of the distribution, we probably ought to begin there. So I'll continue the example with this set of numbers. Okay, if we look at column one, we have a set of x values, and if we're going to want to know how far those values are away from the mean of the distribution. First thing we want to do is calculate the mean, add up all the values, and divide by 6, which is the n, and we get a mean of 5. If we go to column 2, we see that it's labeled x minus x bar. So we're going to subtract the mean from every value, uh, every value in the distribution. So we have 8 minus 5 gives us a value of 3, 5 minus 5 gives us a value of 0, and so on. The problem, if you remember, is that when we do this, the values will wind up adding up to 0. And if they add up to 0, then there's not much we can do with a sum of 0 there. So we're going to try and get around that problem in column 3 by taking each value that we obtained and squaring it. And the reason that we're squaring it is just to get rid of the, the negative value so that we can add to some positive sum. So 3 squared gives us a value of 9. 0 squared gives us a value of 0. We know that when we square negative numbers, we get a positive. So um, negative 2 squared gives us a 4, and so on. Now when we add these numbers together, we do get a sum. We're not going to sum to 0 anymore. In this case, the, the value we get is 26. This is called the sum of squares. Why? Because it's the sum of the squared differences between the, the mean of the distribution and each value in the distribution. We continue with the sum of squares of 26 to this slide so we can continue getting the standard deviation. The next step 
after we get the sum of squares is to get the population or sample variance. And remember that in calculating the standard deviation, calculation of the variance is an intermediate step, and we need to know whether or not we're doing the variance for a population or for a sample. The only thing that's different is the denominator. In the case of population variance, we, count, we divide by n, and in sample variance, we divide by n minus 1. And so for this example, I've decided to make it a sample variance, and so I'm going to divide by n minus 1, which means that my variance is 5.2. The variance is the average squared difference between each score and the mean of the distribution. The average of the squared differences between each score and the mean of the distribution. It's squared because we had to square the differences back in the previous slide in order to get rid of those negative values. But we're not really interested in the squared uh, average difference between each score and the mean, we really want the average distance between the mean and the scores of the distribution. And so in order to get that, we're going to have to unsquare the variance. And so over here in step five, we have the variance, either sample or population. And in order to get the standard deviation, which in this case is the sample standard deviation, we simply have to take the square root of the variance. And so in this case, the square root of 5.2 is 2.28. 2.28 is our standard deviation, the average distance between the mean and the scores in the distribution. We return to this illustration of two distributions, each with the same mean. Notice that the standard deviation is larger when the scores are spread out farther from the mean. Okay, that gives you a nice review of how to obtain the standard deviation. Remember, there's an easier way to get it using a three-step method that I showed in class. The next video will be a review of that three-step method. See you then.